There's no other university in the world that would begin with a student body singing by memory, a student assembly do what is right, then have that beautiful invocation and this very lovely hymn of praise sung and accompanied so well to create a spirit that I'm so grateful for. No one with any degree of spiritual sensitivity, can stand at this place in the presence of such a concentration of devoted, righteous students, faculty, staff, and church leaders, and not feel overwhelmed with gratitude and appreciation. I'm deeply moved in contemplation of what will occur in the ensuing years from experiences you gain at this unique university. The students enrolled in this university have the potential for making deep and abiding contributions throughout the world, to form eternal families, to orient and raise righteous children, to strengthen the host of processions, to give service in countless ways, and to be a leaven for good in a world that desperately needs it. I welcome the 6,000 of you who have recently begun your university career, as well as all who are continuing your education at this cherished institution that has such a prophetic mission. You are part of that mission. My purpose is to share suggestions to help you make the most of this exceptional opportunity for building capacity, strength, understanding, and focus in your life. While most of the remarks are directed to you as students, I pray that some of the insights shared will be of benefit to you who form the exceptional devoted faculty and administration of this university. Before giving specific suggestions, I want to take advantage of a unique teaching moment that we are all currently experiencing. It is my intent to draw from the life of men exceptional in their capacities, of world renown in their accomplishments, yet who are at opposite poles of peace and personal satisfaction at this moment. I refer to President of the United States, Bill Clinton, and to the prophets of God and presidents of this Church whom we revere. President Clinton has expressed anguish and concern for the consequences of his improper choices that have seriously affected his personal life, his wife, his daughter, individuals who work closely with him, the nation, and others throughout the world. I will briefly describe what, in my own opinion, has occurred and ask you to draw conclusions from those events to guide your own lives. Then I will speak of our prophets that they may continue to inspire you personally. Please listen carefully to not misunderstand what I say. I pray to be led in the statements that follow. President Clinton has made declarations of incorrect decisions in his personal life. What is proper for him and for the others who have responsibilities to act, to do? What should you and I do about it? I am not placing myself in the position to exercise judgment on those who are deeply involved in this matter. I simply want to point out what I understand the Lord has said and what the laws of this nation require. Learning from this experience can be of great personal benefit in helping you make correct choices in life. First, concerning unchanging standards. Our Father in Heaven has made it very clear 
that the covenant of marriage is sacred. The responsibilities that attend it are very clearly defined in his scriptures. The command, companions, commandments state, Thou shalt not commit adultery. The Savior taught, Ye have heard that it is said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto her and unto none else. Thou shalt not steal, neither commit adultery, nor do anything like unto it. And he that has committed adultery, and repents with all his heart, and forsaketh it, and doeth it no more, thou shalt forgive. The central purpose of the Savior's life on earth was to atone for the transgressions of all mankind that would accept his commandments and live them. His sinless life was voluntarily given to take upon himself the consequences of the demands of justice for all who violate any commandment, large or small. He has provided the process of repentance to help every individual rectify mistakes made on this earth through the power of mercy. Mercy does not overcome the demands of justice, but satisfies them through his payment of those demands when earned by our complete, sincere repentance, as defined in his teachings. He has promised, Behold, he who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. By this ye may know if a man repenteth of his sins, behold, he will confess them and forsake them. President Clinton recently stated in a prayer breakfast with religious leaders that he has begun that process. That matter should now rest in the hands of the president, his religious supervisors, and the Lord to see that it is thoroughly and properly performed. Don't read or otherwise fill your mind with the salacious details of this controversy. No good will come of that. For some, it could lead to destructive experimentation in absolute violation of the commandments of God. What should you and I do regarding this matter? The Lord has said, I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, but of you it is required to forgive all men. I understand that means to forgive another's offense against me. I have forgiven the present of any personal offense. I continue to pray for him, his wife, and daughter, and to ask the Lord to strengthen and guide him and help him make the right choices in this time of difficulty. I pray for the others who are adversely affected by his decisions. However, that forgiveness does not wipe out the consequences of those improper choices. They must be resolved before the Lord and before those who are charged with the responsibility to evaluate any violation of the trust that President Clinton took upon himself with the oath of office and the acceptance of the responsibilities that result from it as President of the United States. The Lord has said, For if him unto whom much is given, much is required. There are other passages of Scripture that confirm that we are not only responsible for our individual acts, but must be accountable for those that we influence when we have positions of responsibility. 
That is true for a father, a mother, a bishop, a stake president, or a civic leader who has made a promise to be honorable in carrying out his or hers office. When there is a violation of that trust, there is a need to follow the procedures that have been established to rectify it. As far as President Clinton is concerned, that process has begun and is in the hands of the Congress, who has the constitutional responsibility to evaluate it and to take the appropriate action. Let us pray that all involved in that process will be led to make the correct decisions there are two patterns for making decisions in life. The first I will call decisions based on circumstance. The second, decisions based upon eternal truth. I've chosen the experience of President Clinton and the lives of the prophets to illustrate each of these patterns and their consequences. The guiding principle in the pattern of life where decisions are based on circumstances, is to make them according to the outcome desired. There is no underlying set of values or standards used that consistently guide those decisions. Each one is made on what appears to be the best choice at the moment. One who chooses this pattern of action is left to his own strength, and capacity, and the support of others that can be influenced to act in his favor. Satan encourages choices to be made in this manner because he gives him the greatest possibility to tempt an individual to make decisions that will be harmful and destructive, even though they appear to be most appealing when the decision is made. The prophets have followed the second pattern of making decisions, decisions based upon eternal truth, the pattern of the Lord. They have consistently centered their lives in the commandments of God. Their decisions have been and are made in accordance with those unchanging truths. In addition to his own strength and capacity, a prophet enjoys the blessing derived from design inspiration when needed and power from God. As do you when you follow the same pattern. His actions are predictable and bless the lives of all those who look to him for guidance. Those who follow the counsel of prophets will not be led astray nor disappointed. He lives a life of peace and happiness. Such men are instruments of tremendous good throughout the world. All who follow their example and counsel will be blessed. I am grateful to have known and loved prophets of God, the individuals that have been called by the Lord to be president of this church are the most important human beings on earth. The Lord places on their shoulders a responsibility and trust that exceeds that of any other man. A prophet can be trusted for what he is, even more than what he has capacity to do. The worthy character of these humble men is like a fabric woven from countless threads of correct choices, some small, some great, some difficult to make, others less challenging. You can form worthy character in the same way. I spoke earlier of repentance. I would add serious transgressions, such as immorality, require the participation of one who holds the keys of authority such as a bishop or a stake president, to quietly work out the repentance process, to make sure that it is complete and appropriately done. That priesthood officer has the responsibility 
to determine what action regarding membership should be taken. And if there is the required broken heart and contrite spirit, to allow the miracle of the atonement to cleanse, purify the life of the transgressor. This process is confidential. It is carried out privately under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Never make the mistake to believe that because you have confessed a serious transgression, that you have repented of it. That's an essential step, but is not all that is required. Nor assume that because someone did not ask you all of the details of a transgression, that you are free from the responsibilities to mention them. Where transgression, such as immortality, immortality requires a judge in Israel, you personally have the responsibility to make sure that he understands all of the details so that he can properly help you through the process of repentance to full forgiveness. Should there be anyone among us today that requires that further evaluation, please talk to your bishop now. Make sure that as you are seeking an eternal companion, that nothing is done that will offend the spirit. Satan tempts a weaker individual to rationalize that when two are in love and agree that sexual intimacies can be performed, that such things are acceptable. They are not. The boundaries of appropriate behavior are defined by God himself in the sacred, private parts of the body. There are centered powerful emotions intended to be used within the covenant of marriage between a husband and wife in ways that are appropriate and acceptable to both of them. They are not to be stimulated or used for personal gratification outside the covenant of marriage. Do not touch the private sacred parts of another person's body to stimulate those emotions or allow anyone to do that with you, with or without clothing. Do not stimulate those emotions in your own body. These things are wrong. Do not do them. Such actions place barriers to the Holy Spirit. You need that direction to guide you in the important choices you make here at the university. Such practices would undermine your ability to be inspired in the vitally important decisions you must make here. I know that you've chosen to make decisions blessed upon eternal truth, or you wouldn't be here today. Please never allow yourself to make an exception to that pattern of life. To gain a temporary appealing advantage or to participate in any experience you know to be unworthy. How can you keep your resolve to live worthily? How can you be sure that your determination, that of your heart, will not be eroded by the pressures around you? Choose good friends who have made a similar decision in their lives from among the student body, the faculty, and your priesthood leaders. Those like yourselves who elect to keep order and restraint and to use time wisely. Students who go astray generally choose the other kind of friends. Be surrounded by those who are true friends, who accept you the way you are, and leave you better because of their association. Remember the sound teachings you've gathered thus far in your life. Much of the disappointment and tragedy that one encounters in university life come from the new freedom to do anything desired. At this time of transition, where you've increased control of your life, Make decisions wisely. 
you will be helped by the guidance of the Holy Spirit because of your determination to obey the Lord. There's no guarantee that life will be easy for any of us. We grow and learn more rapidly by facing and overcoming challenges. You are here to prove yourselves, to develop, to overcome. There will be constant challenges that cause you to think, to make proper judgments, and to act righteously. You will grow from these challenges. However, there are some challenges you need never encounter. There are those associated with serious transgression. As you continue to avoid such mistakes, your life will be simpler and happier. Now, I would like to discuss three levels of learning that are available here at Brigham Young University and mention some suggestions to help you obtain the maximum benefit from each one of them. The first level of learning I would call formal instruction. This is the level you're most familiar with. You've worked hard to get here. You've chosen a field of study and are busy garnering what you can from the classes. You have selected the professors and their assistants that will help you. Formal instruction is focused on what you hear, read, and write, as well as your expression in class, your study, and your effort to acquire an understanding of the materials shared with you. Success in formal instruction requires discipline and the use of time and in scheduling your study to minimize conflicts of overlapping assignments and competing activities. Consistent study habits that focus on daily application of effort to learn are far more effective than panic cramming near times of testing. Consistent learning allows you to grasp the essentials of your courses so that you may apply them throughout your life. Formal instruction is generally built upon a sequence that employs previously learned material. Hence, concentrated, sporadic study won't allow you to attain the understanding you need to master the materials. Formal instruction in a university requires self-motivated initiative. It is enriched when you go beyond the minimum requirements and do extra work. That requires a balance in the load you carry. Condition that academic load to be a reasonable evaluation of your capacity, not too much and certainly not too little. If you're struggling with how to set those limits, seek help. You'll have to initiate that request for help you're not alone here, but part of your growth and experience is to learn how to find needed assistance. Those abilities will help you through Lao's journey, for we all need help to succeed. You may be tempted to say, I have so much to do, I can't take on any more. The struggle I have to meet the minimum academic requirements is almost more than I can handle. I'm not suggesting that you work harder, unless you're not tugging at your limits already. I am encouraging you to, to work more intelligently. Let me share with you how. It is by using two other levels of learning. At first, it may seem just like more to do. But as you consistently use them, your university experience will be easier, as will the rest of your life. The second level of learning is that of being that comes through social interaction. I mean, how to deal effectively with others, 
how to live and serve productively at all levels. Often those who do extremely well scholastically lack confidence in their social skills. At this university, that challenge can be met and overcome. The most important lessons can be learned by careful observation. Study how those who make friends easily and seem to be natural leaders and therefore contribute much act. What motivates them? How do they relate with others? These lessons you can learn in the classroom and in extracurricular activities. Yet there is no way to learn more effectively than through service to others. Each of you has the opportunity of giving of yourself through your ward or stake activities. That can either be a formal service by accepting a call when it is made, or it can be by observing a need and administering to it in the life of another individual. Learn to serve here, not to be served. There is immense happiness in selfless service. Selfless service will lead you to learn principles of effective, harmonious human interactions. Carefully observe what goes on about you in the classroom, and especially out of it. It is not likely that the most treasured truths you will carry away from this educational experience will occur at the feet of a master teacher. Rather, they will be distilled from many careful observations and crucially important promptings that can pass unperceived, run recorded in your consciousness unless you search for them. In a society of today, where you grow as an individual, as a family, as a professional, there is increasing need for skill and in interaction with others. Learn it while you're here. Observe what yields enduring good and develops the kind of relationships that are desirable. Determine how they're obtained. Put them in practice. Remember the core principle is to give of self while showing genuine interest in others. The third level of learning comes from qualifying to obtain spiritual direction in your life. It is the most rewarding and possibly the most difficult initially to feel confident using. It is centered in that quality of being called righteousness. To be righteous is to seek intently to be obedient to the commandments of God. It is to be clean in thought and act. It is to be honest and just. Continually bless your life with the power of righteousness. Righteousness engenders trust, builds confidence. It yields enduring, worthy achievement. Righteousness is shown more in acts than in words. A clever individual without foundation of principle can at times acquire temporarily impressive accomplishments. Yet that accomplishment is like a sandcastle. When the test of character comes, it crumbles and falls, often taking others with it. Despite how carefully a transgressor seeks to keep violation of commandments secret and hidden, in time they nearly always become public. Satan himself sees to that. He and his angels are determined to cause the greatest possible harm to each of Father in Heaven's children. 
one serious act of disobedience, a violation of trust, invariably raises questions of whether or not there are other. It undermines the faith and confidence of others in that individual, whether warranted or not. Worthy character, centered in truth, fortified by continued correct decisions, anchored in integrity, is what I know you have decided to acquire in your life, or you wouldn't be here. Let me help you understand how to do that. This is a time to set your course for life, a time to establish fundamental priorities. One of the opportunities you now have is to be able to differentiate among the many good and bad things that can be done, to select those that are righteous and truly essential. Here you enjoy personal freedom that likely you have never had before. That freedom can be a friend or an enemy, depending upon how it's used. You will come to find that the restraints provided by the teachings of the Lord actually form a platform to greater freedom. Should they be hurriedly dismantled in the excitement of increased personal choice, serious problems can re result. Carefully consider your options and make correct choices to establish the proper priorities in this critical phase of your life. Continue to be one who invariably makes choices <clears throat> consistent with the commandments of God, and you'll be on a secure path. He is tempted to temporarily set aside standards to gain an attractive advantage. Is on the path that leads to heartache and disappointment. The BYU Honor Code is a tool to help you consistently follow the correct pattern of life, the one the Lord has outlined. I've discussed three levels of learning. Conscientiously use each of them. Your objective is not to get through the university, but to absorb and use the experiences that can be acquired here the knowledge that can be obtained through righteous effort, and the lessons that can be learned from consistently facing and resolving the challenges that you will encounter in your academic, social, and private life. The inspiration of the Spirit will help you do that. In this university, you not only can learn knowledge essential to your chosen field, you can learn how to live life to its fullest. As you augment your learning by what you observe and what you perceive by the Spirit, you'll greatly increase your capacity to be successful in life. You'll be led to establish objectives for life, which will likely be more enduring, productive, and satisfying than you otherwise would select you'll discover more of your true potential. If your focus at BYU has been primarily to excel in formal instruction, you've not understood the rich potential available to you here. Formal instruction can be attained at any good university. Be wise. Benefit by consistently using all three levels of learning available to you here. In closing, may I speak from my heart to each individual present. The Lord has a purpose for you individually to be at this singular campus as a student or a member of the faculty or staff. Discover it and fulfill it. It will likely not be revealed all at once, but will be unfolded line upon line 
as you pray and work hard, you will find threads of understanding that will lead you to the path the Lord wants you to follow for the greatest enduring, meaningful attainment, contribution, joy, and peace of mind. Faithfully and courageously follow those threads of understanding and direction. As a student, that will require focused effort, stretching your capacities, and often setting aside things that would be pleasant and enjoyable in preference to essential things that must be done. Here you can find the beginnings of what the Lord has intended for you to accomplish in life. I feel to promise you that if you that as you continually learn from the three levels we have discussed, you gain the training, orientation, and capacity the Lord would have you acquire while here, they will yield much joy and a productive life now and eternally. As a member of the faculty, that would mean concentrating more on what you feel the Lord wants done here with your capacity and strengths than on gaining the recognition and acceptance of your professional peers throughout the world. I'm a member of the Board of Education that oversees this university and one of its executive committee. We anguish over the reality that because of limited resources, many of the choice youth and gifted faculty and highly skilled professionals among the membership of the Church cannot experience the blessings of being at Brigham Young University. I am aware of the very large investment of the Church in this institution, both in money and in human resources. I ask sincerely that if anyone who hears or reads this message has decided to concentrate only on formal education, ignoring the other unique opportunities here, or if a faculty member has chosen to be more concerned about peer acceptance than meeting squarely the goals and objectives of this university, or should there be anyone who has any intent to violate the code of honor, please consider fulfilling your expectations at another university. Your ambition can adequately be met there, and you would open a place for another to fully utilize the unique experiences offered at this university. As an ecclesiastical leader, if you find someone in any of these categories, help them change to gain a broader vision, or help them go elsewhere. In an exercise of a sacred privilege that can be used when prompted by the Holy Spirit, in behalf of Elder Iring and I, and I invoke a blessing upon each of you, a blessing that according to your faith in Jesus Christ, your obedience to his commandments, and your diligent effort that you may be strengthened and guided in your effort to live righteously. Also, that you will succeed in your chosen field and develop those skills that will lead you to live productively and joyfully. I invoke a blessing that according to your righteousness, your faith, and commitment to live worthily, you will be given support to resist the efforts of Satan cause you to violate your standards so that you may remain morally clean, pure, and righteous. I bear witness that the Savior will guide you through the Holy Ghost. As you steadfastly do what is right, make the correct choices according to his teachings, using the pattern of decisions based upon eternal truths. That pattern of life will lead you to success, accomplishment, peace, happiness, and great joy. I solemnly bear witness 
that you are precious and special spirits who have the opportunity to be here. We pray for you. We love you. We want the best for you. I know the great vast majority are already doing the things I've talked about. Help others you find who haven't found that way. I know that Jesus Christ lives. I solemnly witness that he lives. He loves you and will help you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.